Okay, good morning. So, um, this is a continuation. Oh, Tim, do you want everybody to be unmuted or muted? Maybe muted is better because I get noises coming through. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yes. okay. So, um, this is part five of the topic of finding joy through life's challenges. And uh, I, I need to repeat certain things to remind us of what the theme is and what actually joy is. So I'd like to begin by um, what are the differences between happiness and joy? Because we these words are used interchangeably. But actually, there is a difference, at least in the root meaning. So this uh, man with lots of money is very happy. But uh, so happiness is based on our circumstances. It comes from the root word hap, which means luck or chance. Because something happens to me, I'm happy. So if I, I win the lottery, I'm happy. If I win, a, uh, my football team wins a game, I'm happy, and, and so on. But the word joy is based on our internal state. It comes from the root word simcha, which means to rejoice. It's something I choose to do. So whatever my external circumstances are, I can still find joy. We all want to be happy and we want happy circumstances. But actually, true joy is, is an internal state within us. And um, now I'd like to read a few words from Father, who explains that joy actually comes from love. And we all know that, but this is what he says. God is the origin of heart and emotion, and his purpose is to create joy. But one cannot feel joy alone. The greatest joy comes from the exchange of love between subject and object partners. So this is a picture of my daughter and my, my daughter and my granddaughter. And I have to say, I have never seen Lisa so happy, or may I say, so joyful, because she has the love of her life. She has her object partner and she feels love for her object partner. And I'm sure her daughter feels the same. But actually it's not just with humans. Um, oh, what happened then? Uh -huh. I wanted to show, well, it doesn't come up. Anyway, I have a picture of my uh, cat. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I don't know why it hasn't come up, but my cat, um, it's like a human being because it seeks love and it comes to me sometimes because it wants to be stroked. And when I stroke my cat, it, um, it closes his eyes and purrs and uh, its tail moves and its whole body responds to love. And so I can see like um, <laughs> that like it receives love, but also I can see myself in that cat because if somebody gives me a stroke or a hug, I also, my eyes may close and I may purr. So there are similarities. So let's move on. So what does the divine principle say about joy and love? Joy arises when we have an object partner in which our internal nature and external form are reflected and developed. So we actually can feel our own nature within an object partner. So if you look at my granddaughter's face, can, you can feel in another human being in the kind of the purity and innocence of that face, it reflects something about our own purity and innocence. And, um, oh, actually now here's the cat, yes. So this is my cat. <laughs> and uh, I mean, just look at his face. You know, it's, it's just, just wants to be loved. So uh, it's when we, when we give love to something or to someone, actually we're feeling our own nature within that. If we don't feel love, if we feel distant or we don't like a person, we can't feel our own nature because it's not reflected. So that's why we need to give love because when we give love, we realize that every single human being on this earth has God's spirit and God's presence within them. And all of nature, all of creation, when we look at it with the eyes of love, we feel our own nature, our own nature stimulated by it. So I think this is quite a, a deep concept. 
So all of these uh, talks I've been giving are based upon uh, the Book of Joy, in which the Dalai Lama and Desmond Tutu, they met on the occasion of the Dalai Lama's 80th birthday in, uh, in India. And um, Douglas Abrams is a psychologist, and he took the opportunity to ask them what joy means to them, and also what are some of life's challenges, and how do they overcome them? So they identified in this book these challenges, which all of us face at one time or another, stress, sadness, anxiety, fear, loneliness, envy, frustration, anger, despair, illness, and grief. You cannot avoid suffering. So the question is, what do we do about it? And what they have come up with are eight pillars of joy, eight things which, which we can use to, to deal with our challenges and with the suffering that, that we experience. So there are four qualities of mind, which I've already talked about. The first perspective, and I suppose this is the base and the foundation of everything because it's the way we look at life. If something bad happens to me, I, I can um, be unhappy, I can complain, uh, I can focus on the problem. But if we change our perspective, we can find joy. And this is what the Dalai Lama did. He, for the last uh, 50 plus years, he has been um, unable to live in his own country. But he has a very positive perspective on things because he says he's actually broadened his mind because he's been able to be in contact with people from different religions and different backgrounds. And so he appreciates that. And um, so the perspective makes all the difference. And then humility, humor, and acceptance, acceptance of our situation also takes away our focus on our suffering. And last time I talked about forgiveness because forgiveness is letting go of the past rather than repeating over and over again in your mind and your heart all the things that have gone wrong in your life or the mistakes you've made, which is pointless, we have to let it go. So today, um, I'm going to focus on gratitude. How does gratitude give us joy? How does gratitude help us to overcome life's challenges? So there are two questions I would like to address. First of all, how does gratitude give us joy when facing life's challenges? How does it work? And secondly, are we aware of how gratitude and complaint affect our lives? Because awareness is very important because we have habits. We say things, we do things, and we're not always aware of maybe how much we're complaining or how, how grateful we are. And so being aware of how we are thinking and feeling and acting every day. That awareness makes all the difference of how we react to life's challenges. So here we are, gratitude. One of the best ways, of course, to show gratitude is to pray before we eat. But if you look at this picture, it's not just the food we, that they are grateful for, or, but actually if you look at the whole picture, they have each other. They have the parents, the children, and the grandparents. And so they can be grateful for each other, for the love that they share, and for the time that they can spend together, and the things they do together. And also the food. The food, actually all of that food was grown somewhere and was then collected, transported, brought to the shops. And uh, when we go to a shop, everything is done for us. So many people are involved in actually bringing that food to a supermarket. And then we see there are plates, knives and forks, glasses, water. Are we grateful for the water we drink every day? What a gift that is. And of course, they're sitting at a table. <laughs> so, I mean, we have, we have so many blessings in our life that we don't always think about. And then, of course, there's furniture in the background where they can keep things. And if you look at each person, we're blessed with a physical body. The hands, the fingers, <laughs> our hair, our eyes, our nose, 
our ears, I mean, all the five senses. So actually, if we are aware each day of all the blessings that we have, then our gratitude grows. And with gratitude, blessing grows. And then more joy. So I think being aware each day of all our blessings is so important. And um, this is a little prayer, maybe then encapsulates, you know, we thank you, Lord, for the food before us, the shelter around us, the family beside us, and love between us. Amen. So when we express gratitude, it creates an energy within us. It, it actually stimulates our heart. It raises our vibration and it makes us realize or feel how fortunate we are. So counting our blessings, this is what life is all about. Rather than counting your misfortunes, why don't we just focus each day and count how many wonderful things we experience? And this is a little poem. Count your blessings instead of your crosses. Count your gains instead of your losses. Count your joys instead of your woes. Count your friends instead of your foes. Count your smiles instead of your tears. Count your courage instead of your fears. So this is, you know, it's our perspective. What do we focus on? What are we aware of? In a typical day, how much are we counting our blessings and seeing the good things in life? And how much are we affected or pulled down or focus on the things that are wrong? And how much do we, <laughs> how much are we grateful? And how much do we complain? So this is a, a little quote. It says, gratitude is the law of increase and complaint is the law of decrease. And it's true. Gratitude is like the great multiplier. Gratitude is the bridge to love. Gratitude gives you more blessings. So the more grateful you are, the, the more blessings come to you. And the more you complain, the more problems come to you. So there's another quote. Gratitude is riches, complaint is poverty. So we know this, but then we need to practice it and we need to be aware of how we are thinking each day. If we want to receive blessing, focus on gratitude. The more we complain, the more we lose. And uh, this little picture maybe uh, sums up um, the reality of human beings. So uh, many more people are likely to complain than to show gratitude. We all know that we have fallen nature. We know we have an original nature. Our original nature will only express our gratitude for all the blessings we have in life. But because we have fallen nature, we have two natures, it takes effort to develop gratitude. Of course, where am I and where are you, you know, on the line between complaint and gratitude? How much in each day do we express gratitude and how often do we complain? And how aware of are we of, of what we are doing every day? So this is a little cartoon, a little conversation between a pig and a dog. And the dog says, what do you view as the world's biggest problem? And the pig says, that's easy, lack of gratitude. And then if we were all just more grateful, the pig says, for what God has given us, instead of worrying about what we don't have, most of the world's problems would be cleared up. What do you think is the biggest problem today? And of course, <laughs> the dog says, lack of cookies. So we can talk about many things, but how are we thinking? You know, we, how, how, you know, we can think many big thoughts, but it's actually, it's the little things that count. And to be aware of those little things and not having the temptation to find something to complain about. And then we have this expression, is your glass half empty or half full? <clears throat> do you look on the bright side of life or do you look on the dark side of life? Where are we? Are we more, are we the per am I the person that sees my glass more half empty or more half full? Well, of course, another way to look at it is it doesn't matter if the glass is half empty or half full. 
be thankful that you have a glass and grateful that there's something in it. But of course, this expression can both be literal or, or more symbolic. So now I'd like to um, talk about an example of a boy who had a short life. He only lived to the age of 13 <clears throat> called Matty J.T. Stepanik, an American boy. And you can see that he's having some problems with breathing. He has a tube there. And um, so what, does, what did he say about uh, having a, is your glass half empty or half full? He said this, remember to look at your glass half full and not half empty. A lot of my strength comes from God. God has given me a gift, the gift of life. And it's amazing I live each day. Of course, that's a what for, for a boy to, to express that is pretty deep. But actually, this boy was also suffering from a deadly disease. He suffered from a rare form of muscular dystrophy, and his three siblings died from the same disease. So imagine if three of your siblings, when you're a child, die and you have the same disease, and you know you're also going to die. But what an incredible mindset. How could he, how could he in all his, his suffering, have such a smile on his face and have such an attitude? But he did much more than that in his short life. He published seven best-selling books of poetry and peace essays. So you might say in his short life, he achieved far more through his suffering than most people ever would. And um, he even met, and he became quite a famous person, and uh, he met President uh, Jimmy Carter. And Jimmy Carter said this about his poems. Through his poems, Matty reminds us to find something amazing, even the most trivial things, and to celebrate the gifts of life each day. So the person like him, so young, and with a serious health situation, could, could be thankful for his life, then what are we complaining about? You know, we mustn't, we shouldn't find little things to complain about. We should find every little thing to be grateful for. So this is one of his books. It's called Journey Through Heart Songs. And I'd like to share one of his poems, which is called Prayer for a Journey. Thank you, God, not just for life, but for our journey through life. Life is a miracle. And a journey through life is so full of so many miracles if we travel with our heart songs. So his heart songs are the poems that come from his heart. Thank you, God, for blessing me with the gift of heart songs so that I can enjoy my miracles. What a wonderful, what a wonderful human being. And now I'd like to share the story of another person who went through a lot of suffering, but overcame it. This is Anthony Ray Hinton. And Anthony Ray Hinton was wrongly convicted of the 1985 murders of two fast food restaurant managers in Birmingham, Alabama. And um, he spent 30 years on death row. And when he was put in prison, he was told by the police officers that the reason he's going to jail is because he's a black man. So can you imagine how much resentment he could have or how much hatred he could have for policemen or white people or even God? You know, why, why am I being treated like this? And he lived in a five by seven foot cell in solitary confinement, allowed out only one hour a day. How do you deal with this? Most people would, would just probably uh, fester in, in resentment and uh, stay stuck there, but he didn't do that. He became a friend to the inmates and he was actually a model prisoner. And the police, the, those working in, in the, the um, prison were actually begging that he be released because they could see what a good person he was. And he was released um, from prison on April the 3rd, 2015. 
and um, of course, uh, he became a, a celebrity. And then what did he do? He didn't just uh, live a quiet life. He wrote a book, The Sun Does Shine. How I Found Life or, and Freedom on Death Row. And um, he says this in his book, people run out of the rain. I run into the rain. Having missed the rain for so many years, I am so grateful for every drop, just to feel it on my face. The world didn't give you your joy and the world can't take it away. You can let people come into your life and destroy it, but I refuse to let anyone take my joy. <clears throat> I get up in the morning and I don't need anyone to make me laugh. I am going to laugh on my own because I have been blessed to see another day. And when you are blessed to see another day, that should automatically give you joy. Now, Hinton, when he was interviewed on the American television show 60 Minutes, the interviewer asked him whether he was angry at those who had put him in jail. He responded that he had forgiven all the people who had sent him to jail. And the interviewer incredulously asked, but they took 30 years of your life. How can you not be angry? Hinton responded, if I'm angry and unforgiving, they will have taken the rest of my life. You know, unforgiveness robs us of our ability to enjoy and appreciate our life because we're trapped in a past filled with anger and bitterness. Forgiveness allows us to move beyond the past and appreciate the present, including the drops of rain falling on our face. So, you know, forgiveness, <laughs> if we can let go of the past, then we can appreciate the present and then we can be grateful for the present every single moment. So what is the positive impact of gratitude? Yeah? Are we aware of actually how, how it benefits us? Well, I'd like to share studies from Professor Robert Emmons, who studied um, the impact of gratitude on people's lives for over 20 years. And he comes up with a long list. First of all, people who are grateful show more empathy. They are more generous. They're likely to give emotional support to others. They often exercise. They have fewer physical symptoms. They feel better about their lives. They're more positive about the week ahead and they're more likely to achieve personal goals. They report more positive emotions. They have more vitality, are more optimistic about life. They feel greater life satisfaction. They have lower levels of stress and are less depressed. So based upon all these studies, then actually, if we want to be joyful, if we want to have a happy life, then the more gratitude we have, the better. So these are scientific studies, you know. So there's so many positive impacts of being grateful. So all we've got to do is practice it. And also grateful people smile more. And um, smiling for as little as 20 seconds can trigger positive emotions. Smiling stimulates the release of serotonin, which is an antidepressant. Dopamine, which stimulates reward centers, and endorphins, which are natural painkillers. So I, if you think of a joyful person, a joyful person smiles a lot. If you think of a grateful person, that grateful person who sees the beauty of life will be, be full of laughter and sm smiling and joy. So, so these are the two questions I had at the beginning. How does gratitude give us joy when facing life's challenges? Well, based upon those studies, we can see the benefit. It, it actually, it actually uh, affects our physical body and it affects our mind. And are we aware of how gratitude and complaint affects our life? So I suppose the more we complain, then we could say that, um, if we go back a little bit, if we could turn this around, 
that the more we complain, we have less empathy, we're less generous and so on. So if you want to experience negative in things in your life, please complain. Okay, so let's move on. Um, we, we, in our understanding, we make conditions. We make conditions because we're in this midway position. And if we want to come closer to God, we need to separate from Satan and we make a foundation of faith and a foundation of substance. And so whether it's a prayer condition, a fasting, bowing, or whatever, conditions can change us, like change our habits. And so I'd like to present to you uh, uh, 28 days of gratitude, practicing it for 28 days, and how this can actually change our habits, our mindset, and bring many blessings to us. And this, this comes from Rhonda Byrne. And for those of you who know who she is, she wrote the book, The Secret, about the law of attraction. And she says, you know, that actually the, the, what's behind the law of attraction is love. The more you love, the more you give love, the more you receive. But she has also written a book called The Magic. And the magic is only about gratitude. And so I'd like to share with you what she suggests for 28 days, how you can practice gratitude to bring blessings into your life. So in the morning, first of all, make a list of 10 blessings in your life you are grateful for. Write why you're grateful for each blessing. Go back and read your list. At the end of each one, say the magic words, thank you, three times, and feel grateful as much as you can. So. I've been doing this and I can tell you when you do this, it somehow it internally, it brings an, a change. It, it, you feel love within yourself. You, 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 you really become much more aware of all the blessings you have. And so um, it, it's very beneficial. But then she says at bedtime, how do you end your day? She says, yes, find a small stone and put it, by your bedside, you know, like a smooth stone you can easily hold in your hand. Before going to sleep, hold the stone in your hand and think of the best thing that happened today. Say the magic words, thank you. So, of course, if you think about your day, you're going to think about all the good things that happened, all the things you're grateful for. So it's not just finding the best, but become aware of all the good things. But by saying thank you, for the best, you're also ending the day with, with a very peaceful mind. So this book, <clears throat> actually every day, this is what you should do, but she also has many other uh, daily practices which go together with this. And one thing, one particular chapter is all about overcoming negativity through the power of gratitude. So I'd like to share um, how how she suggests when you have negative things, challenges in your life, how can you overcome? So, for example, this is directly from the book. Let's say you lose your job. And in this time of the pandemic, many people have lost their jobs. So what are the positives from if you were to lose a job? How, so she suggests writing down, finding 10 things you're grateful for. If you if something bad happens, like losing your job, first of all, she says this, I'm so grateful to have had more time for my family during this period. I'm grateful that my life is in a lot of better order because of the spare time. I'm grateful that I've had a job most of my life and that I am experienced. I'm truly grateful that this is the first time I've been unemployed. And I'm grateful that there are jobs out there and more new jobs are, are appearing each day. I'm grateful for all the things I've learned in going for interviews. I'm grateful that I have my health and that I can work. I'm grateful for my family's encouragement and support. I'm grateful for the rest I've had because I needed it. And finally, I'm grateful that through losing my job, I've realized how much having a job means to me. I had never realized that until now. So 
the idea basically here is that when something bad happens, find 10 things, the good things that come out of that bad experience. So you turn it around. So, you know, rather than being pulled down by the problem, you actually see beyond it. And now I'd like to bring some final words from, from Father. So he says this, be grateful even when there is nothing to be grateful for. And I suppose, you know, if you do that, you don't focus. You don't focus on the problem. Just, just be grateful. And we know Father, I mean, he was in prison six times. If he'd complained, he probably would not have survived. But he just kept this attitude and he didn't want to burden God. He always was grateful for his life. And there is a quote from Father, which I couldn't find, but I think it's from Father, where he says that, you know, gratitude is heaven and complaint is hell. And in line with that, he says, whoever can feel grateful, even in the midst of impossible circumstances, will find themselves in the highest place in spirit world. And then he suggests this, for one week, try to be always grateful and happy as much as you can. Then, at the end of the week, pray to God about anything. You will feel that your prayer will come more freely and be answered right away. It will be like seeing the sunshine. So gratitude affects our life of faith and our connection to God. And so with that, I'd like to say thank you for listening.